us from the second book of the law, Exodus, in the 17th chapter, verses 1 through 17. Listen, it's not 17, 1 through 7, that would be a long reading. 1 through 7, listen for God's word to you this morning. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journey by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water. And the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt? to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock, and water will come out of it, so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massah and Meribah, because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be. Goes down the beanstalk with the giant's gold, then cuts it down as the giant falls to his death. Little Red Riding Hood and her grandmother are rescued from the belly of the wolf. The baker and his wife lift the family cursed that had left them childless, and the witch regains her former beauty. The narrator explains, it came to pass all that seemed wrong was now right. The kingdoms were filled with joy, and those who deserved to were certain to live a long and happy life. He sings ever after, journey over. All is mended, and not just for today, but tomorrow and extended ever after. F. F. Scott Fitzgerald once wrote that there are no second acts in American lives. It's a quote that usually gets used to prove the opposite. Back when Into the Woods premiered on Broadway, I had friends who wished there was no second act for Into the Woods. We like our fairy tales neat and tidy. We want it to be true that all who deserve to are certain to live long and happy lives. But there is a second act. There's a second, a third, sometimes even a fourth or fifth act to our lives. And there's a second act for Into the Woods. It picks up where the first left off. The characters sing in turn, I never thought I'd wed a prince. I never thought I'd find perfection. I never thought I would be so happy. And you know it won't last. In fact, by the end of that song, the roof of the baker's house has fallen in, the witch's garden has been trampled, and the wife of the giant that Jack killed has come for her revenge. It's not unlike the long-running musical The Fantastics. The first act ends with the lovers, Matt and Louisa, coming together after being kept apart by their parents, and they sing a song entitled Happy Ending. The curtain falls. The second act begins with a wake-up call as the characters sing, This plum is too ripe. What at night seemed oh so scenic may be cynic in the light. Now this is more than just a trip down musical theater memory lane. Most people treat the Exodus story like it doesn't have a second act. 
We love to hear about the baby Moses found in the basket of reeds, rescued from the genocidal order of the Pharaoh. His life is then thrown into chaos as he's older, and he kills an Egyptian overseer who's abusing a Hebrew slave. He runs away, but God calls him back to liberate his people. It takes ten plagues, but the Pharaoh, who's also his adoptive brother, finally lets the people go and they make their harrowing escape through the parted waters of the Red Sea. They even have their own final number as Miriam sings about horse and rider thrown into the sea and curtain. Maybe an epilogue where Moses comes down the mountain with the Ten Commandments, but let's not muddy the water, shall we? Only that isn't how this story ends. That isn't where this story ends. We might wish it were, but it isn't. Now, when Fitzgerald wrote that sentence about second acts, I'm guessing he was writing about failure, not success, the missed opportunity that doesn't come around a second time. But in this instance, when you've reached your ever after, you don't want a second act. The heavy burdens imposed by the Egyptians through forced labor have been lifted. God has rescued them with grand, this grand unforgettable act of separating the waters before them to set them free, fade to black. And we want that only because we know too well that isn't the case. Which is sort of the point of the second act of both those musicals. The problem with the notion of the happy ending is that in reality, life goes on. Resolution over here often leads to a whole new set of considerations over there. We think that once we get the degree, or find a partner, land the dream job, start a family, that we'll live happily ever after. But we don't. So we assemble a whole new set of aspirations once the kids are gone and, and I'm able to retire and we take care of mom and dad, then life will settle down and we'll really be able to enjoy ourselves. Funny thing happens on the way to the happy ending. There's a giant or something equally expected, life. A spouse dies too soon. The kids come back to live at home. The doctor calls wanting to run a few more tests. One minute you're walking through improbable walls of water on your way to freedom in the promised land. The next minute you find yourself in a barren landscape of the wilderness wishing things could go back to the way they were. Where once you were surrounded by water, now you find that things have dried up considerably. All your plans, all your expectations, all your happily ever afters have fallen upon dry times. Author Gail Sheedy tells of a 46-year-old newscaster who had climbed to the top of her profession and was basking in the affluence that went with it. However, she was not satisfied or fulfilled as one might think. She said one day, I am near the top of the mountain that I saw when I was young. I have yearned for this my whole life. But lo and behold, now at the top of this mountain, it's not snow up here. It's mostly salt that burns the wounds inflicted getting to the top. All the people I've ignored and used, all the other dreams deferred by my ambition. It turns out that going down the mountain is quite different than climbing it. Where, she asks, are the navigational charts? Faith, it turns out, isn't found in our success in the victory won on our behalf, in the happily ever after. Faith is found, faith is made real and deepened during the dry times. Faith is what comes next. 
when the waters are behind us and the desert stretches out before us and we have no other choice but to walk into it even though we know we are not com we are completely unprepared for the ways in which such a landscape will test us and try our willingness to trust that God knows what God is doing by leading us into such hostile territory. I think this is what Paul is getting at when he urges the church to work out their salvation with fear and trembling. He's talking about this life on the other side of salvation. The expanse of time and space that stretches out from the miracle that rescues us from certain death to the promised land where the fullness of life awaits us. There is no route between those two places that won't test our trust in God. Just because we've seen and believe the miracle that has saved us doesn't mean we won't find ourselves thirsty, questioning why we're even here and the people who are seemingly in charge, questioning what we're doing and why, fearful of our own survival and the survival of all that we hold dear, ready to tear down the leader we see in place of the God we can't, because like the Hebrews in that place, we aren't even sure if God is with us or not. What we learn, however, is that complaining, while certainly understandable, doesn't really solve anything. It definitely can't quench our thirst. Yes, the wilderness is an unforgiving place. Food is scarce and water even more so. But when faced with a crisis, Moses didn't simply throw up his hands and join the chorus of complaints. He brings the problem to God. It's easy to forget and important to remember, critical to remember, that when you're in that dry place, that if God is the one who brought you this far, God will most assuredly get you to the place that you need to go. If God is the one who can make a dry path in the middle of the sea, surely God can provide water in the middle of the desert. It turns out, and those of us who live in the high desert know this all too well, that the plants that thrive best in dry places are often the ones the miraculous thing is the miraculous thing is simply a taste of water that quenches our deep thirst that that satisfies not just our parched throats but our parched souls as well Souls that long to know that wherever the story takes us, God will be there, <coughs> providing for us and assuring us that God is with us through it all <coughs> and to the end. Hallelujah. Amen. With the whole church, if you, as you are able, would you stand as together we say what we believe using the words of the Nicene Creed printed in your worship order. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. 
On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.